Hey guys, it's Bill here from Bull Flag Group and we're testing out the green screen. Let us know what you think. If you hate it, let us know. If you love it, let us know. But before we move forward, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Let us know that you like the content that we're putting out and leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. So today's episode is going to be uh, Mance Harmon from Hedera Hashgraph and we're going to talk about the use of the platform. We're going to talk about comparing it to Ethereum, validators, nodes on the network. Is it decentralized? Is it not decentralized, the use of the HBAR token, who's going to be using this in the future, and where he sees it in the next five years. I hope you enjoy the interview and check it out. I'm really excited because I've got a great guest on here today. Super pumped, super uh, hyped project, but for good reason, okay? The project is much different, and uh, they got some extreme... Um, Publicity last year, 2018, was a big year for, for, for uh, Hedera Hashgraph. And, uh, you know, I've talked to different members of the team, and I'm really excited to have the man himself here, uh, Mance, who's going to talk to us about Hedera Hashgraph, what they're doing, what they're not doing, the Libra competition, um, you know, pretty much everything. He's going to bring us up to speed on the project you know, when we can get some more updates and uh, I'm super excited. So this is one of those projects that I've personally been waiting for. Um, it's different in many ways. It's not claiming to do everything. Uh, it, you know, I'm very impressed with the way they structured their, uh, their initial raise, the way they structured the publicity, the marketing, everything. So uh, Mance, I'll let you take it away and introduce yourself and kind of give us a little introduction on yourself and, you know, where the project is right now. Okay, great. Well, thank you for your interest and for having me here today. Uh, briefly about me, and I'll comment on my co-founder as well, Lehman. We've been working together for 25 years, since 93. We are deep tech, machine learning background, cybersecurity background software engineering background. We've done a couple of startups previously as well. And, uh, you know, now bring all that to bear here on, on Hedera. Lehman, of course, is the one that invented Hashgraph, the algorithm. He started working on that in 2012. In 2015, he had a big breakthrough, which is now what we call Hashgraph. And we pursued that for a couple of years for permissioned networks, building out the initial code base, working with a very small group of initial customers to, to prove that out. In 2017, we got to the point where we decided we're ready to begin pursuing a public network built on Hashgraph, and uh, we spun out from Swirled, the parent company that we started to, to pursue permissioned use cases, Hedera, Hedera Hashgraph. And Hedera, of course, is uh, all about building this public ledger uh, using the Hashgraph algorithm. It's got some cool tech. It's got a fantastic governance model that's uh, uh, almost unique in the market. In fact, we'll talk about this, but you know, Libra has sort of validated the, the approach in that they have used the same governance model that, that we're using or something very similar anyway. And uh, here we are after a couple of years of, of development and, and progress getting ready to launch the network into the market in, in weeks time. That's great. I think one place to start out is let's hit the Facebook project first and let's talk about the, uh, the advertisement that was out there that got a lot of publicity. Yeah. Um, you guys were trying to send a message. What is that message? Well, so when we started Hedera, back in 2017, we had a particular vision for what a, a you know, distributed or decentralized governance body or governing body should be. And we, by design, created a, a governing body that was meant to be the most distributed in the market. Um, 39 members, they, with representation across 18 sectors of the market, not a bunch of banks, not a bunch of, of organizations that are somehow related in an industry in any way, but 18 sectors and geo-distributed. So we were choosing members, are choosing members of our governing body from a global set of uh, large organizations that are across industry to be representative of all the use cases in, in the market on a global basis. And then finally, 
they can't stay members forever. So it's also distributed or decentralized through time. The members, our members, can stay members for up to two, three-year terms for a max of six. So by its design, it was meant to be more decentralized than any project in the market. We were the only ones doing it. And there were some very specific reasons that we took that approach, which we could go into. But what's interesting is that until Libra came to market, until Facebook made their announcement, no one else was doing it. And, um, and, and for them to think that, yes, that's the correct approach was gratifying, right? Um, we sat down with David Marcus in February of 2018, so a year and a half ago. You know, at that point, Facebook, the project, as I understand it, only had a handful of people that were coming together to begin thinking about what is now Libra, and they were just surveying the market of projects and, and tech in the, in the market. We are one of the companies that they spoke with, and we explained to them why you have to have this particular model to bootstrap trust in a uh, technical trust in a cryptocurrency as well as to help garner market trust in the governing body and uh, you know they took a lot of notes and here we are two years later a year and a half later and, and they've announced labor so so all of that that's the point of the Wall Street Journal ad was merely to say uh, thank you for for the the flattering act right it was, it was tongue-in-cheek Obviously, it was a tongue-in-cheek ad. Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that they did anything wrong. They didn't break any rules or laws or even do anything unethical from my perspective. You know, they're doing the obvious right thing, and, and that's trying to choose, um, you know, the best from where they can get it. And they thought our governing model was the best, and that was that was the, the point. Great for clearing that up. Um, so let's jump into the HBAR token. Um, I think maybe a good way to start the discussion is, you know, let's use Ethereum as an example. What can Hedera do that Ethereum can't or won't be able to do with this potential 2.0 upgrade? Yeah. Well, so to start, performance is hugely different, right? I mean, Ethereum today is on the order of 15 transactions per second. The, you know, they're sort of first generation along with Bitcoin and all the derivatives of proof of work blockchain. Of course, Ethereum is, is making efforts to move from a proof of work solution to a, a proof of stake solution that, you know, provides the additional performance. In our case, we already have it, right? We have the performance. Uh, it is, it's, it's going to be there in the beta version that gets released here in, in just weeks. Uh, when the network goes live, so to speak. And so the performance different, difference for cryptocurrency transactions is huge. Now, the performance difference for smart contracts, and by the way, what we have in our platform are three initial services, cryptocurrency with support for micropayments, direct native support for micropayments, distributed file storage, and smart contracts. And for the smart contracts piece, we simply took Solidity uh, and, and we've implemented it directly on the platform. So the Solidity scripts that are out there that work on Ethereum today, maybe with only tiny modifications, should be able to work directly on, on our platform as well. The Solidity scripts um, you know, won't be as fast as our cryptocurrency because of the nature of Solidity and the way smart contracts work, but they'll still be fast. And uh, so performance is a big deal in terms of the difference between Ethereum and Swirls, or excuse me, uh, Hedera Hashgraph. The other thing is the level of security. So Hedera, or I should say Hashgraph, the algorithm is, you know, a consensus algorithm that's a replacement for blockchain. And it has some theoretical properties that are unmatched in the market. And that is that it achieves the theoretical limit of what can be achieved in terms of security, it's something called asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance, ABFT, as opposed to just simple BFT or not even BFT at all in the terms of proof of work blockchain. And so the security is, 
is going to be better at the algorithm level. Practically, what that means is there is a category of denial of service attacks on the network that simply um, can be mitigated in ways with us that can't be as easily mitigated by the other projects in the market. So there's a difference between security, performance, and then finally there's this thing called fairness. And the idea is that with Hashgraph, it's possible to guarantee that no single member of the network can unduly influence what the order of transactions will be adopted by the entire network. And that's not true for blockchain. It's not true for leader-based systems. It's pretty much not true for everything else in the market. Now, why does that matter? If you're building a distributed stock market, for example, then you really don't want there to be the opportunity for one member of the network, one node operator or miner, to influence what the order ultimately is on the bids and asks flowing into the network because then they have too much power, they have too much control. This isn't just stock market or matching platform applications, it's, it's for games, it's for you know, time limited business transactions. So this fairness property is important across a whole range of use cases and those are the differences. And then finally, the governance model is a big difference for, for us versus Ethereum as well. We are bringing stability to the platform that's difficult for other projects to provide. We can provide a guarantee to the market, for example, that our platform will never split into two competing platforms. It will never fork in the same way that others do. And that, that matters to you know, mainstream business managers considering spending millions of dollars on a, an enterprise app or DAP running on top of the, of the network. So those are major differences between us and Ethereum. So I think you brought up another interesting point. And I always ask everybody, I've asked Algorand, Cosmos, uh, some of the biggest projects out there. Yep. Who is going to be utilizing this technology are we a couple years away from really enterprises embracing this kind of stuff or is there still too much friction? And the, the follow up to that in, in turn is, are you going to have customers, meaning enterprises, businesses, um, purchasing these, th these tokens on an exchange and how does that process look? Yeah. So let me start with the second question first, because it's an easy answer. Yes. <laughs> they, they have to buy the tokens from exchanges in order to use the services of the network. In that regard, we're not any different than Ethereum or most of the projects out there. Um, we have APIs, public APIs, that expose these services, cryptocurrency, smart contracts, etc. And to use those APIs, the dApps that have to, when they make the API calls, they have to pay for those API calls in HBAR with micropayments at the time of the API call. And so that's, you know, that's the, how the revenue flows into the, into the network. It gets paid out to the nodes that process those API calls. The nodes turn around, sell it uh, for, for fiat, you know, exchange it for fiat on the exchanges, and then users, end users that want to use the applications or dApps using the network, they have to buy it or the dApp owners have to buy that, et cetera. That's, that's pretty simple and kind of standard in that regard. So no changes there. To the first question, though, so what we've introduced just a few weeks ago is a brand new service. It's the fourth service. In fact, we're leading with this service. It's called the Hedera Consensus Service. And so, you know, we have the initial three that we've talked about, cryptocurrency, smart contracts, file storage. But really, the Hedera Consensus Service, I think, is the most important and the other services end up being support services. What Hedera Consensus Service does is makes it possible for enterprises that care about privacy, they care about performance, uh, and they need a simple on-ramp to the use of DLTs in a public network to use the Hedera Consensus Service to get the best of both, both worlds, private networks with performance and privacy, public networks for the improved trust model. So when we think about the pros and cons between the two, in a public network, dApps are building applications or distributed applications using smart contracts like 
and smart contract engines like Solidity or the language with the VM. And when those dApps run on these public networks, they have to share resources with every other dApp that's running on that network. And so you have a, a computer, a node, that is running dApps from the entire community all the time, and they have to take their turn to get resources on that node. Well, that makes the applications expensive and slow, right? They can't get a whole node to themselves. And the dApps have to operate on public information. The, the data that they're processing can't be encrypted because if it's encrypted, they can't process it. So it's got to be public. So you're fundamentally limited in terms of privacy, performance, and cost on a public network. But the trust model is so much better on a public network because you have all these nodes that are distributed, run by different organizations, many times anonymous, that's a lot better than a private network where you have a few nodes often running in the same data center. The flip side though, in a private network, you have a fully dedicated network for one application if you want it. Cost is way cheaper and it's private. You get the privacy that, that you don't have in a public network. HCS or the Hedera Consensus Service makes it possible for developers to build an arbitrary application in a private network, keep all the information private, and use the consensus ordering service in the public network for putting the transactions into consensus order. So the public network, Hedera, you get the trust from Hedera for consensus ordering on the transactions that you can use in a private environment. In this combination, um, we've, you know, we've explored this combination now with many of our council members and there are POCs that are kicking off that are using this. We believe this combination is what's required for enterprise adoption of the public consensus, but, but distributed ledger technology in general. And, and so this, I think, is a really big deal. There's no one else in the market that has anything like it. We've introduced it only a few weeks ago, and we did so along with IBM. So we published a white paper with IBM that describes the Hedera Consensus Service and how this relates to Hyperledger Fabric. And you know the ability now for private network platforms like Fabric or Corda or any of the others to use those toolkits to build private enterprise applications but then take advantage of HCS to get the public trust and the consensus ordering and the performance at a really good cost. The combination of the two is what I think the market is looking for and, and will you know, uh, accelerate adoption by enterprises and businesses of distributed ledger technology. So you mentioned nodes and validators. Can you explain... Yeah. Who's going to be running the initial startup, say, in six weeks or whenever this thing goes live? Sure. Um, what's day one look like? And what does uh, six months, 24 months, you know, five years out look like? And how does that differ? Sure. So we're starting with a network of approximately 10 or 12 um, nodes that are controlled from a crypto perspective, by our council members. And this is needed to begin to bootstrap the network. So we'll start with this. On probably a quarterly basis, we will make announcements of additional council members as they join the council. We'll scale up to 39 nodes, each running a, a node in, uh, well, council members, each running a node in the network. That's sort of, phase one or step one. And through that process, we'll be releasing tokens into the market. We want to distribute the tokens broadly. Uh, and we'll talk about a, a release schedule. We'll have a release schedule for those tokens into the market that we'll publish. And then we'll move from the 39 council members operating this initial set of nodes to other sort of participating organizations that are not council members, that are also running nodes. So we'll scale up the number of nodes outside of just the council. And then at a, you know, a moment in time where it's clear 
that the tokens are broadly distributed and um, of high enough value that it's practically impossible for a bad actor or a small group of bad actors to buy up a third. You know, that's the goal, is to make it practically impossible for bad actors to buy up a full third or more of the tokens in the total token supply. When we achieve that, then we will allow anonymous nodes, and then we scale, you know, to anybody. We scale to thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands through a sharded solution. But you have to bootstrap to that point. You can't start there, obviously. You have to get there. And the very first version of this is... Uh, you know, the, the, the number that I described in a, a smaller group and scaling on a quarterly basis. So just to be clear, you're starting off with 10 to 12, but you hope to get to 10,000 at some point. Oh, no question. So the, the vision is to be a permissionless public network. And uh, to, to get there, you have to make sure that you are secure and what security means is that no bad actor can buy up a full third of the token supply. Here's the issue. When you initially launch a token like what we're doing, initially there's not very good distribution of the tokens in the market, and the initial price of the token could be relatively low. And so it's quite possible in the early days that a bad actor could buy up a third. And so to prevent that, you have two-thirds of the total token supply managed or staked by this initial set of members and you keep it that way for some period of time and then you eventually sell more than a third of the tokens into the market so you cross that two-third threshold which is a first milestone the second milestone as long as you don't have anonymous nodes you're still secure and so the second you, you could sell all the tokens into the market and if you still permission, no anonymous nodes in that sense, then you're still secure. So the second milestone is getting to the point where you allow anonymous nodes when you're sure that the security is there. And then you scale on to thousands and tens of thousands of, of nodes in the network. So are there any um, policing of the nodes, say there is a bad actor or simply uh, a country or an individual or some entity that you necessarily don't want to be associated with the project. Um, is there any way to control that? And, and is that, you know, something that you guys took into consideration? I'm thinking kind of yeah. like an EOS type problem with the 21 block producers and people getting voted in and out and maybe new, uh, you know, let, let, this is a total stretch, but let's say there's sure. an ISIS node or something like that, that wants to set up, uh, you know, a, a node for Hedera. Yeah. Is there a backup plan for that? Well, so the question is, what attack are you attempting to prevent, right? And so initially, we know who the node operators are. They, you know, they're our council members. They're not only known to us, they're known to the entire world. They will be known to the entire world. And that's part of the, that's a feature, right? That's, that's not a bug, that's a feature in that the market will trust these organizations to be good actors. That's the reason that we had to start with a really high bar on who council members can be. It, it doesn't work to get 10 of your buds, right, to stand up nodes, because if the value of the token goes up, nobody's gonna trust these guys not to steal the money. So you have to start with trusted organizations, and that's where we're starting. And, uh, and so we're, you know, we're preventing the, the, the belief that there will be collusion among these initial set. At some point, when the token is in the market broadly distributed and we have thousands or tens of thousands of nodes in the market, then it's, you know, it doesn't really matter if an ISIS or whomever stands up a node and operates the node because they can't influence in a meaningful way the order of the transactions. Right, they are going to have a some number of tokens in the network, and the weight of their vote on the order of transactions is the weight of the number of tokens that they have. If it were the case that an ISIS could buy up a third of the tokens, then we got a problem. Right, that that's a that's a bad problem. 
But that's the whole point of the bootstrapping process to go from where we are today and over time get the token value to go up and, and the tokens to be broadly distributed to provide the security to the network that, that's needed so that an ISIS will never be able to buy up a third of the tokens in the market. So it doesn't hurt, in other words. It doesn't really matter if a bad actor is running a node. They can't do anything to, to damage or attack the, the dApps or the transaction order or any of, or any of that. Um, kind of dovetailing that question, any uh, comments on yesterday's announcement from uh, Secretary of Treasury? Um, are you guys anticipating this? Were you guys, you know, in the back of your head, always thinking that there is going to be U.S. regulation at some point, And then how does that impact uh, Hedera at this point? So uh, we've always assumed that there will be regulation. In fact, we've been deeply involved in the dialogue with the various regulators in D.C. for well more than a year now. Um, the, specific, uh, the specifics of what was announced yesterday were already known. So for the past few months anyway, we've seen Treasury and the various parts of Treasury to begin to make announcements in the market. And so nothing that was said yesterday was new information. Uh, and, and we have a regulatory, legal and regulatory committee within Hedera. That's part of the value of having the council, by the way. Um, Hedera, as an organization, has these council members that are members of an LLC. So they're owners. It's not a marketing agreement. They, you know, they're actual owners of the LLC along with us. When I say along with us, what I really mean is we are just the staff of Hedera. The council members own it. And, um, and the value of that is that we have these committees. We have a legal and regulatory committee. Uh, we have a tech steering committee, uh, you know, on and on that, that are having oversight of the different parts of the organization. And legal and regulatory uh, has already been aware of, of what, was, you know, what was announced yesterday. And we've been taking the appropriate steps to be compliant. Now, in this type of environment, I think that what's most important is to be directly engaged with the regulators. You know, having this ongoing dialogue, uh, the last thing that I want to do is do anything that surprises them, right? We want them to know what we're doing. We've told them uh, with reams of documents exactly what we're doing and how we work and why we operate the way, the way we operate. So, um, you know, I think that while we go through this process, all of this chatter, all this discussion in the public arena that's now taking place this summer, especially beginning to take place this summer, is good because it's indication of a maturing market. We have to go through the process of getting the regulations uh, adjusted or um, modified in such a way to address cryptocurrencies or public ledgers in, in a general sense because without it, the market will never mature. And so we know we've got to go through it. I view all of this as healthy. Sure, it causes some people to, to sort of worry about what might or might not happen in the future. We, we may go through some choppy waters between here and there, but we'll get to the other side. And at that point, then uh, we're in a much better place as an industry. And so I think it's, uh, it's all goodness for, for the public network industry. So um, watching some of the other major projects like Algorand come out and essentially drop 75% uh, from the price, how does token price play into the ultimate security of the network? And can the system run properly if there is these, you know, 200% runs versus and 90% drops? How do you see that playing out in the future? And again, you, you mentioned we're going to have choppy water. This is crypto. There's ups and downs. This is a new emerging asset class. It's totally unique. Um, how do you respond to that kind of uh, turbulence in the waters? Yeah. Well, from a security perspective, um, what is important is one of two for us, I'm not, not commenting on other projects, but for us, what's important is one of two things. If either of these are true, then we're secure. 
Um, one, if the nodes in our council have uh, control of two thirds or more of the tokens, we're secure. And it doesn't matter what the token price does, up or down. And, and or um, if there are no anonymous nodes. If we do KYC AML, we know who the node operators are, then we also are secure. It's only an issue when we allow anonymous nodes. If we allow, when we allow anonymous nodes, then it has to be the case that we're confident that it's practically impossible for a third of the tokens to be bought up by a bad actor. So the, you know, the, the fluctuations or the, you know, the, the ups and downs of the token price per se doesn't really affect the security until we get to the point where we're allowing anonymous nodes. Now, there's a separate issue, and that's just what, what does that do in terms of being able to use the network? You know, buy tokens, you've got to buy tokens for the use of the network. In our case, what we're doing is denominating the cost for each API call in fiat. So, it, it, you know, if, if the token price itself fluctuates up and down, it doesn't matter if you're buying the number, the necessary tokens at the moment in time that you want to use them on the network. That if it's a dollar for an API call, it's not a dollar, but you know, to, to make the point, if it were a dollar or a penny uh, to make an API call, you just buy uh, pennies worth of API calls or 10 pennies worth of API calls, and you're going to get some number of tokens, and it's the right number to use the APIs. So the volatility doesn't affect us in, in that regard. Um. Can you comment on whether nodes are going to be viewed at some point as in, in needing money transfer licenses? And, and I guess the same thing could be said for miners for Bitcoin. I mean, do you see that becoming an issue in the future? And are you guys prepared to deal with it? So we are deeply involved in, uh, you know, from a legal perspective and working with the regulators to, to understand the lay of the land, to uh, make the case that you know at one part of the you know the, if we look at the ecosystem as a whole we have opinions on where KYC AML are appropriate and where where it's not so from from our perspective that kind of activity is most appropriately done at what I'll call the edges you know the on ramps if i'm going to a bank and i want to deposit crypto in a bank then it's appropriate perhaps for them to do KYC AML. And we have mechanisms built into the platform that enable that to be simply done. And the same thing would be true for the exchanges. If we're just transferring or you know, putting transactions into order, which is what we, the network, is doing, it's just sort of a utility that puts transactions into an order without understanding what the solutions are doing at a higher level in the stack. By the way, we're not building a payment solution. Hedera doesn't isn't building a payment solution. And this is a big difference between us and say Calibra, for example. So, so Libra is just the, the pipes, the, you know, the, the network itself. Calibra is building a payment solution, which would presumably be subject to more regulatory scrutiny and for various reasons. That's not what we're doing. And so, um, you know, we, we view what we're doing as providing a utility independent of payments or uh, you know any kind of solution in that regard and all of that kind of regulation related to payments etc is appropriate for the applications that are actually enabling payments and and uh, you know that and, and making that their business so I view us as very similar to the telcos right we're, we're the equivalent in terms of infrastructure as the telcos are and should be treated in the same way. Uh, what's the status of the project right now? When can we expect the main net? Um, I know there's some uh, enticing offers to start utilizing the, the test net, it looks like, and getting people involved and kind of testing out the waters. When can we expect you know, a full-blown main net release party, uh, you know, announcement from you guys, and kind of release onto the exchanges? Yeah, so it's close. Um, I think that we it will happen this summer. 
and here we are. It's it's June sixteenth when we're making this video. It's June sixteenth, and July sixteenth. <laughs> I'm sorry, pardon me, my mistake. You're correct. It's July. It's July sixteenth, uh, and so you know, summer is halfway over. I still think it's going to be this summer. So great, and and uh, you know, how do you plan to get developers? Uh, excited about your your platform and uh, you know what what do you guys plan to do to get them over you know say from solidity or some of these other platforms and get excited you know get motivated and, and really jump on board so we have been building a, a developer community I don't know the latest numbers in our discourse channel but it's in the you know in the thousands six thousand seven thousand something like that if I understand correctly we have a developer community already building uh, the, the last number I saw was it was on the order of 500 dApps have registered for and been given access to test networks so you know we have something on the order of 80 or 100 test networks up and running today that support all of those dApps in the dApp community um, we will have dApps that launch with us. So I don't know what that number will be, probably in the dozens, but there will be dApps that launch with us on day one, whenever the network goes live on, on day one. And, um, you know, I, there's, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of activity around hackathons and, you know, the standard kind of development activities for building a, a developer ecosystem. We've been doing a lot of that. But it really begins to take off when the network is in the market. It's operational. People can see and test it, and, and they can do so without having to register with us in any way. No KYC needing to be done. That's what it means to go live, quote, quote, you know, to what we call open access. We've opened the network up for access to anyone in the market that wants it. And when that happens, then you know there's a standard set of activities for the developers to but they'll be able to just take their existing solidity scripts if i'm a developer and i've built solidity scripts for ethereum and i hear that now hedera is open and live and i can go test it of course i'm going to right i'm going to take that script i'm going to go over there i'm going to install it i'm going to see what kind of performance i get and then you, you know they'll be able to do the comparisons so just having the, the network live is a major milestone uh, but we continue what we've already been doing and in terms of supporting the developer community and their ability to to build dApps on, on the platform. That's half of it. And, and, and what we focused here is just the sort of developer community at large. What we're also doing that is less visible is working with enterprises. Uh, to, and we're doing workshops. We're going in. We're spending a day or two or three in some cases, whiteboarding use cases, understanding what their problems are, designing solutions, and going into POC. And, and these are the kind of applications that will drive major volumes on the platform. And often uh, these are using the Hedera consensus service that I mentioned earlier to build out these enterprise grade solutions. So it's both. We're focused on enterprises and have a full plan there for scaling that with global system integrators and global enterprises and just the general DAP community or developer community at large by giving them the tools they need to build these uh, solutions on this next generation network. Where do you see Hedera and where do you see Bitcoin in five years? So Bitcoin... Um, I, I'm ambivalent about Bitcoin. I could see it go in either direction. Uh, it, you know, it has a fantastic brand, right, right? There's a lot of brand equity there. And the interesting thing about that is when institutional money flows into the market, the first thing that the institutions want to do is invest in the best known, you know, what's been around for the longest, in some sense, it's the safest uh, in the sense of uh, token 
price. And that's what institutions will care about when making investments if they're making investments. We, we as a company are focused on network usage. And what we want is the tokens in the market, you know, as we release tokens into the market, we want to do so at a rate that mirrors network usage because that's the, the right way to, to scale the network and, and the you know, releasing of the tokens into the market over time. So five years from now, I expect that we'll have a third or more of the tokens into the market. And uh, we will have crossed that, that major milestone of, of having that magic number, you know, going past a third. And we may very well have also anonymous nodes at that point in time. Our goal, of course, is to scale as fast as possible. And so in five years, I'm hoping and expecting that we will have scaled to the point where we have a permissionless public network with the tokens fully distributed into the market. And the, you know, the, the tokens will be, you know, the price of the token will be representative of the demand for the services on, on the platform. It's sort, of like, it's sort of like this. If you have a subway system and you have a fixed number of tokens for riding the subway, then if the population increases, you know, doubles, triples, quadruples, and everybody's wanting to use the subway, well, now there's fixed supply, more demand, token price goes up for the subway. And what we try to do is match the number of tokens into the market uh, that to, to, you know, in, in the market to, to match the demand for the services of the, of the platform. How can people get a hold of you guys? How can people get active if they're developers and they want to, you know, do just what you said, move Solidity over to Hedera and experiment? I mean, what's the best way to get a hold of you guys, the team, the developers? Yeah, so the website is a good place to start. Um, the tools are there to, to download and, and get started building dApps. There, there's contact information there for how to reach the various, develop, what we call developer advocates, the DAs, developer advocates, that provide the support. Um, we will be, you know, on an ongoing basis, we will be adding more and more documentation so that it's easy for developers to just do, uh, you know, one-click install and have all the documentation needed to begin doing development. But it's, uh, it's all there on the website. It shouldn't be hard to find us to, you know, to get the support that's needed. Very good. I pre appreciate your time and uh, looking forward to watching the project grow and wish you the best of luck. And I'm um, there's no doubt that you guys are, you know, top tier projects out there and uh, happy to watch you guys succeed in the future. So uh, good luck and uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. It's good talking with you. I hope you enjoyed the interview. I hope you enjoyed the quality content that we're providing for you guys. Please subscribe to our channel down below and always check out some of the new videos that we have available. If there's somebody you want to see as an interviewee on our channel, let us know. We'll reach out. Thank you guys. I appreciate the support and as always subscribe.